with the comms guys and we have brought along a very special guest today. Um, he is the, the very famous Mr. Chimes, Mr. Terry Chimes, he used to be the drummer with The Clash. And he's going to talk to us today about um, his story with The Clash and some really interesting stories. If any of you have got any questions or anything afterwards, then, then maybe put it in the chat. We'll, we'll ask him um, or he can read them. Um, and but, Howard, yeah. can I suggest the chat is just too hard to do. So at okay. the end, we just ask people to come off of mute and just ask questions. Yeah, yeah. It's just dead easy. That's fine. Is that cool? That's fine. Um, so without much further ado, you may all recognise this. We'd like to introduce the very famous Mr. Chimes himself. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's lovely to be here. I'm, I'm flattered you all came along to hear my story. Hope I don't disappoint you. I'm going to just talk about what I've done and what, you know, where I've been and um, leave hopefully lots of time for questions because I've no idea what particular thing you're interested in, really. So uh, I grew up in the East End which is still the, um, the poorest borough in the country, apparently, despite all the yuppies moving in. But back then, it was an interesting place to grow up. People had very low expectations. In fact, I saw a comedian the other day on TV talking about the East End. He said, when we were at school, we had low expectations of life. And I said to my friends, when I grow up, I'm going to be a van driver. And they all said, we can't be van drivers. We take the stuff to the van for the van driver to drive off. So that was his kind of humorous take on that. But I never suffered from that because I had parents who always said you can do anything you want, which is a gift, I think. And I went to a grammar school where they kind of bigged you up and said you can do whatever you want and so on. So I, I, that was good. And I was one of those strange kids that had lots of pets. I had loads of animals all over the place, hamsters, ferrets, toads, frogs, I don't know, whatever. And I was the only one in the family that liked animals, so it freaked everyone else out, but I, I still did it. And so I kind of wanted to be a vet when I was a kid. Then I realized two things. One is that is not a good job for an animal lover because you kill animals most of the day. And two, the patients bite you. So I didn't fancy that much either. So then I thought maybe I'd become a doctor. And is this guy, those older ones amongst you, remember Dr. Kildare, or it was a TV show. And there's this very good looking guy who was a, a doctor and he would save lives every week. And there's always some gorgeous nurse saying, doctor, you're so wonderful. And I thought, well, I could do that. And then I went to my local GP and there's always old men in the waiting room coughing up blood. And I thought, God, this is probably more like the real thing than the Dr. Goodair. So I thought again. And then um, something happened then uh, in my life. When I was about 10 uh, at primary school, a girl came up to me and said, did you hear the news? I said, no, what? She says, it's terrible. They searched Mick Jagger's house for drugs and they found a naked lady in his wardrobe. So I thought, yeah, I said, yeah, that's terrible. And I thought that's my career plan for the next 20 years then. They become a rock musician. And, you know, when you discover girls, you realise to get the girls, you've got to be um, a football player or a musician. And I was no good at football, so it left me very few options, really. But I carried on studying for a career in medicine. I even went to interviews at medical schools, dental schools, but it all seemed a bit too kind of serious. So when I left school, I went straight into finding a band. So I auditioned for every band I could find, uh, most of which were a waste of time. And there's that point in life where you're really working hard and pushing and pushing, thinking, will this ever get anywhere? But I, I was, when you're, when you're a teenager, you know everything, don't you? And you're very determined, so you just keep going. And one fortunate thing, I think, was um, I had an older brother, three years older than me, and he was also in the drums, but in classical music, he played timpani. And um, so he was pushing really hard on that. And he, um, he went to the Royal College of Music when he was 18, and within a year, he was being offered work by all the major orchestras because he was really good at it. So when I was, let me work this out, when I was 16 and a half, maybe 17, he was appearing on TV doing the last night of the proms with the BBC Timid Orchestra. So I thought, wow, that's pretty good. And uh, so that was a gift as well, because when you're a kid, you look at things on TV, you think there's a great big um, barrier or, you know, chasm between the world you're in the world they're in you've got Beatles now I could never be in that world but actually I thought well he's on TV why can't I be on TV so that's quite quite good oh it's a little digression but I'll tell you I think this is a really funny story my brother played the last night of the proms every year for 41 years 300 million people watching live every year 
And about two or three years ago, he did it for the last time because he was retiring. So uh, I sat down with my mother to watch it. And she said, will I announce that he's retiring? I said, mum, every year, at least half a dozen people retire. and No one's ever announced any retirement for 41 years. She said, yeah, but he's been there 41 years. I said, well, we'll see. So we watched this concert. And they stopped the concert. They have John, my brother John, stand up and take a bow. Saying, this is John Chimes. He's been here 41 years. He's retiring. Big round of applause. And then the 300 million people thought, right, now let's get on with the next song. And I turned to my mum and said, there you are. She said, well, they might have let him make a speech. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. A mother, I was thinking, you should stop the whole concert and say, right, I'd like to thank my Uncle Joe for my first chance, all this sort of thing. Anyway, that's beside the point. So it was good to have that, that um, pioneering, you know, being on TV before I got there. And I auditioned with all these bands, mostly of No Hopers. And when I came across The Clash, they were a bit different because they seemed to be really sure, certain, I would say, that they were going to go somewhere. And looking back, having read all those books like Think and Grow Rich and As a Man Thinketh and all those books about, you know, what's in your mind will become what, what your world is, they actually were doing that. They didn't know they were doing that. They were just very determined. But they were, I think, what people, NLP people call them... Um, unconsciously competent. They were doing it without realizing why they were doing it, but it works. And that was another lesson because we did very well, we got famous very quickly. Um, and then, uh, but I fell out with them all the time. I was always arguing with them. Um, and it was always me versus all the band, the management, the road crew and everyone else that was there versus me. Uh, and I found it, it's an incredible coincidence that they were all wrong and I was right. That was really strange. But anyway, that was happening all the time. So in the end, I got fed up and I left. But, I, but when I left, they couldn't find anyone at first. So I, I, I did the first album, which is good, because that, that kind of put down what we'd done at that point. It was like, um, it wasn't really so much as recording an album. It's like going to the studio and slapping down the live set we always did. So it's the fastest recording ever, I think. But um, it, that album still has that kind of fresh, kind of uh, outrush of energy that we had in the live gigs in those days. And, um, and then... Uh, they eventually found Topper, who, uh, who came in and, and did a really good job, but he got into drugs, unfortunately, so he got out of control. So five years later, having played with other people like Billy Idol from Generation X and Johnny Thunders, um, they asked me to come back. And just like The Clash, because they were kind of chaotic, um, why don't you come back and do a tour of America? I say, OK, when's the tour? They said, in five days. Said, oh, my God, you've done 25,000 albums since I last spoke to you. I've got to learn all these songs and, and rehearse them and get over to America. Uh, anyway, we managed to do it. So we did that. Um, lots of things happened on the way. Um, some all sorts of funny stories. I noticed one of the questions someone put up early on is um, uh, about any crazy things happening on the road. You know, the, who used to drive Rolls Royces and swimming pools and that kind of thing. I think you'll find that's quite an expensive hobby, that sort of thing. So we, we didn't really do that. But there was lots of, were well, lots of strange th things happen on the way, on the road. Um, I can remember one time when we went to um, Houston, Texas, and I've got a cousin that lives there. He works for NASA, and they're a very, very straight living, clean living religious family. But I invited him to the gig, so they came along, and I said, "Do you want to come back to the hotel afterwards for a drink?" Said, okay, they came back to the hotel, and the hotel, I guess it was a motel because they had a big swimming pool in the middle and all these rooms around it, and. For some reason that night, half of the audience came back as well. And there, it was a really crazy party. You know, people were stripping off and jumping into the water and there's loads of crazy music and everyone was drunk. And then in the middle of it, Cosmo Varnell, who was our spokesperson, he, he stood up and said, um, I'm a hairdresser. If anyone wants a haircut, I can do a haircut. I know it was Paul with bass player. I thought, it's not a hairdresser, is he? What's he talking about? He was blind drunk. And what he'd done a few days previously was he'd given several people in the crew, in the band, uh, a mohawk. In other words, he cut the hair either side. Well, he didn't have to be a hairdresser to do that. He just chop it off. So he'd done that and thought he was a hairdresser. So two girls popped up with lovely long hair and said, yeah, I'll have a hairdo. So one sat in the chair and he started hacking away at this girl's hair. And we were thinking, oh my God, this is a nightmare. Because you know when you get like a, a, a chair and one leg's a bit longer, you start to chop them off and you, you can't seem to get all four the same length. And it gets shorter and shorter. It was like that. When it got down to the length of like Luke there, about that sort of length, he kind of gave up and took a load of gel and put it on and molded it to the right shape and said, there you are. And we were thinking when she wakes up in the morning, she's going to have the shock of her life. It'll be like crazy angles and that and just mad. But the beauty of rock and roll is, of course, when she wakes up and screams, we're on a plane to the next, um, next city. 
And then the second girl, he said to the second girl, okay, your turn. She said, uh, no, I think I'll leave it. And uh, she was well drunk, but she wasn't that drunk to, to go and do that. And uh, after all that craziness, and when my cousin was leaving, I said, we don't normally do all these things. She said, oh, no, of course not. No, but he's thinking in his head, well, he does, it, does this every night. <laughs> so that was kind of funny. Um, but uh, life on the road was, was, it was fun because we had Joe Strummer up front and he was an interesting character because he had a, a bee in his bonnet. He didn't want the show to be the same thing every night. So we had a different set list every night, different songs. And that played havoc because coming back into the band and learning, I don't know how many, it must be a hundred songs. It's kind of hard work and if they keep changing, we couldn't quite. But I understood where he was coming from because most bands don't do exactly the same show every night. Every joke is the same, every song, every lighting thing. And it's kind of, it's not really, um, it's a bit routine, you know, like playing an, an actor in a show. It's not really surreal. So we enjoyed doing that. And, and Joe was funny. He'd like, I remember once we were playing in an indoor stadium, a huge place. And um, just in the middle of the gig, he said, you there at the back, right at the back, by the door. Well, there was about a thousand doors in this place. So everyone looked around. He said, there's a light switch by the door. Can you just flick it on? So with the lighting guy, I thought he wants the lights on. So he put on about 12 megawatts of light and the whole place came up. And everyone's looking over thinking, God, there's a light switch and put all these lights on. <laughs> he would do this stuff off the cuff all the time, just making stuff up as he went along. Um, so that was kind of fun because you never knew quite what was going to happen. And what audiences really like, I found, is that they like... Um, when a guest comes from another band and gets on and plays with you, they love that because they know that's a one-off, a special performance and not going to be repeated. I remember we were playing in, uh, in New York once, um, Pier 48 it's called, and uh, we were really late. Well, we were always late, but we were especially late this time. And it was pouring with rain, absolutely pouring. So the audience were getting soaking wet and they were like waiting for two hours for us to come on stage. And unfortunately, something happened we had a new member of the road crew, and when you're new, when you're new in a job, you like to impress, don't you? Think about a new idea. So this guy came out with a really good idea. When you're playing guitar, you break plectrum. You have these plectrums, little you know plastic picks. You break them or you drop them. So you need spare ones. And we used to put a big ugly piece of gaffer gaffer tape, double sided, and put them on there. But he had a good idea. He got a, a can of spray of these. He sprayed the amp, and you could put them anywhere on the amp, and they would just stay there. Great idea. Unfortunately, put the can of glue uh, in the dressing room next to the hairspray. So someone's spraying the hair just before going on stage. And, you know, um, hairspray comes uh, like light, firm and extra firm. And this was really firm, this glue. <laughs> so there's a big upset there. It's glue all over his hair. So someone said, OK, don't worry. Put your head in this, this sink. We'll get some fairy liquid or whatever it's called on there and rubbed it in. And after 10 minutes, it just turned green, but it didn't make any difference. So... Someone said, we've got some methylated spirits, that kind of for cleaning guitars, that'll do it. So put that on. That turned it blue, but it still wouldn't come off. And, um, and people were singing, you know, were just screaming and shouting. The promoter came in and said, if you didn't go on that stage, I'm going to sue you. And just slammed the door in his face. And we're all sitting there kind of thinking, what the hell are we going to do? And my wife at the time was outside thinking, what the hell are they doing in there? So she put her head in and said, what's going on? And I said, he's got glue in his hair. So without any hesitation, she said, why doesn't he wear a hat? So we all looked at the hat he'd been wearing when he came in and him and it, yes, put the hat on, bang, straight on the stage. Um, and what that taught me was, when you focus on a problem, you're stuck in the problem. She was outside focusing on the solution, like get the band on the stage. So as soon as she came in, she'd get the hat on. So that was quite interesting. But we were so pent up with anger. We went out and gave, I put the best show we ever did. We just smacked into that audience. And they were so soaking wet, they were drenched through. So. You couldn't get any wet, you might as well have been sitting in the river. So they didn't care. And then there's this enormous thunderstorm, this crazy thunder lighting up, lighter than all the lights we had. So that was kind of magical. So they kept asking for more and more and more encores. We kept playing loads of encores, any old thing we could think of. So that was probably my, my favourite ever gig, that one, even though it started off quite badly. But you never know in rock and roll what's going to happen. So then um, after, I, um, at the end of that, time uh, we toured America and we toured England we toured America and then we went and toured with the Who we supported the Who on their farewell tour which was the biggest tour in the world at the time and that was another funny story so because when you're doing a big tour like that you only play once every three days because it takes three days to get the gear down take it somewhere else and put it back up again so we did a couple of shows other places just to fill in the time so we did a show at uh, I think it was Kent State University 
and they gave us the gymnasium as a dressing room. And you know those people that get on the on the bars and they swing, I don't know what they do, but they, they have this white powder, don't they, for their hands? There's a great big silver bowl full of white powder. So I took a picture of me with it. And then when I got home, I said to people, this is the Who's dressing room, look at the cocaine. And every single person felt it, went, my gosh, that must be a million dollars worth. So that was kind of fun. Uh, but playing with the Who was interesting because you did your show and came off, you could watch them play and relax rather than being the headline actor. That was kind of nice. And um, people said to me, what's it like playing to such a large number, you know, 100,000 people at a time? I said, well, actually, you're going to do the same thing. If it's one person in the audience or 100,000, it's the same thing. So you just go on and do it. Although some people get nervous in front of a big crowd. Um, in fact, with The Clash, before we went on stage, every gig, Mick Jones, the guitar player, he'd be throwing up because he'd be so nervous. And Joe would be really happy. When we came off stage, Mick would be fine. They're all happy and running around. And Joe would be sitting with his head in his hands saying it's the end of the world. So it's a strange. And they never changed right from the beginning, right through from 76 to 83. They never changed. And then after that, um, I had a break from music because they, they were kind of splitting up and going haywire. They get this idea of firing Mick, which I thought, well, that's not going to work at all. You can't fire the person who writes the, the best songs. So that all fell apart. So, uh, and then I, I went off on, oh, I had another um, invitation to go and play music, a band called Hanoi Rocks from, um, from uh, Finland. And I would played with them uh, on the same bill as them a few times. So I know each other, we sometimes play together a bit. And then what happened, uh, what's that band called? Oh God, who did Girls, Girls, Girls? What's it called, the band? God, someone help me. Uh, you know the band, Girls, Girls, Girls? No, not the band, the song they did was Girls, Girls, Motley Girls. Crew. Motley Crew, that's it. Uh, they went out driving with their drummer and the idiot smashed the car up and killed the drummer. Drummers always die first, by the way. Don't you notice? There's always a drummer that dies first. One died the other day. Um, just three days ago, another dead drummer I heard about. The drummer from um, Cotney Reject just died. Ringo. Ago. Ringo's alive. Oh, yeah. Well, he's the exception that proves the rule. So, uh, anyway, he died. So, they said, um, we want, we've got to play to an audience of 200 million people on live satellite TV. It's a European-wide thing. Can you play the drums? I said, yeah, fine. When is it? They said, five days. I said, oh my God, what is this about five days? Okay, I'll learn the songs. But I was just about to have my wisdom teeth removed. So I went to the hospital, had them removed. They sent the tapes over. But when I came out, I looked at, it was a funny moment because I got up in the middle of the night, having had a general anesthetic. I staggered to the bathroom, turned the light on. And when you turn the light, you expect to see you in the mirror, don't you? But actually it's just like monstrosity with a huge, like, a, like an Aranya Tang on steroids in there. I thought, great, I'm playing the 200 million people with a face like a demented hamster. But um, and I had to put the headphones on, listen to this really loud Walker's music and learn all the songs before we did it. And when we got there, we played 10 songs. I said, which one are you going to send to all those millions of people? He said, we don't know, we'll make our mind up on the day. So you have to learn them all. I thought, oh, thanks. Thanks for that as well. Anyway, we did it and it was fine. My face came down to almost reasonable level. Then um, what happened after that? Oh, and then uh, I heard Black Sabbath were looking for a drummer. And uh, I'd listened to him as a kid. I loved those as a kid. It's one of my favorite bands. So I thought it'd be great to go and play with them. So um, I said to my manager, well, get me in there. So he said, okay, we've booked phone to them. Go down and, uh, you know, about three days and go and play, uh, audition for them. And every drummer in London or in, in England wanted the job. So um, I went a bit over the top. It's just another life lesson, really. I went over the top and I, I got um, their live album and a bunch of other albums. I used to teach people to play drums. So I phoned up a guy who's a fanatic and said, have you got Black Sabbath albums? Yeah, I've got all of them. Why? I said, oh, can you bring them around now? Because I've got to learn some songs. Said, oh my God, I come he came straight around. So I listened to all these songs and I learned them. I played them over and over and learned them perfectly. Because I know when you audition someone, how annoying it is when they turn up to play and they go, well, I sort of listened to the song a bit. And it's like, well, what are you, are you serious about this or not? So I learned them. So I played one song with them, Black Sabbath. And they said, um, do you know any other songs? I said, I know all of them on your live album. I've, men I've, I've memorized them all, so you can do what you like. So he played one or two more. And then Tony Omi said, bring the other drummers and tell them not to bother. We've, we've, we're sorted. That's it. Which is great. So that, that proves yeah, if you want something, you just got to get out of your comfort zone, work hard and grab it. And that was fun working with Black Sabbath because they've been through all the drugs and the drink and all the craziness. So he said, well, we've got, we've got two rules. We all turn up on time and we're all stone cold sober at least till after the gig. And I thought, oh, thank God. What a change. So that was nice and did some touring in Europe with them. That was good. And eventually I, did, I had a calling from a young age that I wanted to be a, some kind of doctor or vet or something. And by that time I was a, a you know, a non-drinking, non-smoking, non-drug taking, vegetarian sort of health nut. So 
it didn't make sense to do anything with drugs. So I'll play chiropractor and acupuncturist because chiropractor and acupuncture, chiropractic and acupuncture, there are no drugs. There's, no, you, there's nothing in there. You can fix people uh, without any of that nasty stuff. And bizarrely, I was in Sun City with, um, with uh, Black Sabbath. It's my first tour with them. And I, I, had, I was playing temping bowling. And I threw this heavy ball down the thing about 150 times or about three hours. And after a few hours, I couldn't move my arm. It just got stuck. That's not good when you're a drummer. And they said, it's okay, we'll get a chiropractor in. And I'd never heard of it. And I said, well, what are you going to do? They said, well, he'll fix you. So this guy came in, cracked all my joints and everything without any x-rays or tests. He just went bang, bang, bang. And I could move my arm. I thought, wow, that's pretty clever. And that was like a seed. Because when you look back on your life, you see you are... There are signposts all the way telling you which way to go, but you don't know it while you're in it. You only know it looking back. So I went off to college, spent five years studying that and studied acupuncture as well, and then went off, set up a clinic, and everything's been fine ever since. I've owned five clinics. Of, I've had children recently. You can't do it when well, you can do it, but I don't think you can have kids when you're in rock and roll and be a proper father because you're away all the time. So I, I did it recently. And um, so when I had kids, I sold all my clinics and just went down treating people individually because it, I didn't want to be running a business because you, you, know, you need time for your kids. And that brings us up to now. So that's where I am now. So um, that's a bit of a whirlwind tour. I've probably forgotten loads of things, but um, does that give you an idea of where I've been, what I've done? Yeah. So would you like to move to some questions? I think we're going to unmoot for questions. If you want to unmoot and ask me a question. Yeah. Um, do you still keep in touch with any rock stars? Um, I, I was keeping it fairly regular touch until uh, I had babies and I thought I can't be doing with that. I'm too busy with babies. Although, funny enough, I was booked to do a show. You know, Brian James from um, The Damned, he was given an award by some uh, magazine and he said, we're going to do a big award ceremony. Could you play drums? And we're going to get for other people from other bands. So that was booked and then the lockdown happened and we had to cancel. So there's a few things in the pipeline. I guess we'll do it in October or November or something like that. So I, I see it occasionally. But uh, I don't go my way. I just bump into them, either in the street or uh, some party or something. Uh, Terry, uh, thank you for that. Oh, can sorry. I ask, uh, can I ask questions? So I would yeah. really bore the hell out of everyone. Nice to meet you, Terry. Thank you. Um, Black Sabbath, Billy Idol, Hello Rocks, The Clash, mind blowing. What's it like to play with the most iconic? rock, heavy metal, punk, ska people ever in world history, basically? Uh, well, it's, it's <laughs> different. when you're on the other side of the, of the stage, it's a different experience. When I went to, um, I went to Sun City with um, Iomi, Tony Iomi, we played our first ever gig, and I was, I've never been a nervous, but, but still, your first gig in front of thousands of people, and you've got to get it right. The record company are there, the management's there, they're all in, what's the new guy like, you know? And probably half the guys that were supposed to audition are there as well. So um, um, the first song, you know, we'd go on there, we, we, uh, we start playing. I mean, the first song, we're 20 seconds in. I think, well, I can hear everything. Everything works good. Stay cool. Just keep to the thing. I look up and Tony Omi is turned around to me with a, with a plectrum bounced on his nose. He's sort of doing this like, look, I can balance the plectrum, which is kind of funny. He, was, he is a bit of a joker. So it's always sounds people saying we're with the rocking away and he's doing playing silly tricks and stuff. So that that was good. That kind of settled me. I thought, okay, yeah, he's having a laugh. And we can all have a laugh together. I'll tell you another funny thing about that. It just came to mind. With the clash, we always had the same intro music. So when you walk on the stage, you have some music playing, so there's not silence. And it was like a, a big organ, big gothic organ, followed by like a kind of spaghetti western music with trumpets and drums, you know, really good. Anyway, we go on there and you get on there, and you say, right. I've got drumsticks, I've got a drink, everything is where it should be, my flies are done up, we're all, we're all good to go, you know. And then, and your, your, your adrenaline's pumping then, your heart's pumping, because you've got a thousand people you've got to play to. And then, at some point, uh, they cut the music and we go smack, and we go into the show. Well, I did that every night for, for ages. And then, 20 years later, I'm in a, a nightclub somewhere, God knows where it was, and they put that same music on. And it must be a peculiar thing. It's just like Pavlov's dogs. I thought, oh, God, I'm all right. I'm going to go. And I'm jumping up and down. My heart's going. I'm thinking, what the hell's wrong with you? You're not doing a gig. You're just listening to some music. But it's really weird the way that gets into you and turns things on. Very strange. Can I, Terry, that's one, ask one more question. How, and I think this, this can be put through to like all the 
Is it pure? How is it? What was your networking like? Because obviously dealing with all of these. And was it for networking to get where you wanted to be? Or was it just you was there and it was pure luck on the phone call? I like to think it was my looks, but maybe that's not the case. <laughs> I don't know. But um, it, well, the first band you get into, going to Clash, that was the first one. And then people have seen you or heard you since then. So it kind of, they'll find you. Several times a band has called up whoever I'm with and said, we'd like to talk to Terry. And he said, well, I'll pass it on, but I don't think he'll call you. And then they haven't given me the number. <laughs> so that, because they don't want me to leave. It's like football, isn't it? Transfers. So they don't want you to leave. So um, who was it? Uh, it was the, the cults. They rang up, say we'd like to, and the banners would say, no, 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 we, he won't be interested in joining you, you know. And I never actually got the message till years later, which was um, <laughs> was too late. And um, and oh, and my manager said to me after I, I went to college and I'd been there a year and I passed all my exams, I was settled, I had some friends, I you know, I was all settled down. And my manager rang me up and said, look, ACDC need a drummer, and they specified he must be non-drinker, don't want to get getting drunk or out of their head on drugs. It must be able to play to huge stadium audiences without being nervous, it must be experienced, it must be a real hard hitting rock drummer and a reasonable person, no stupid personality problems. And he mustn't be American. I don't know why that was. And he said, you're the only person in the world that fits that description. <laughs> and I, he said, what do you want to do? I'll fly you out there and, and play with them, see what you think. And I was just getting settled in my new career. And I thought, this is life testing you isn't it saying are you sure you, you made your decision are you really determined to go this way or do you want to be tempted back so i said to him you know what i phoned the next day and said don't don't call him because i'm not going to do it so there's no point he said oh, i thought you might say that but interesting how life plays little tricks with you, you know, see if you really mean it yeah, like covid yeah. <laughs> can, can i just so terry uh, thank you very much mate that was genius by the way um, the guy who was just asking a question is, is Dan Sugarman, and he can shred a guitar himself. He's a, he's a, oh. he's a gangster. Uh, I will say, you're the least like rock star, rock star I've ever, ever had a joy. You would hate us because we all pretend to be rock stars, but we're not. And, and drummers get a really hard time. But you, you sir, are, are as bright as a button, and I love, I love your stories. Can, can I ask you a question, if I may? Um, as, a, as a band, and in multiple bands, how did bands deal with dramas? You know, something goes off and everyone's emotional. They're all creative. If, if something happened, what, 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 what was, the, it, was there a routine? Was there a process? Or was it, you know, did everyone have a second role within the band, the peacemaker or the comedian? How, how did that, when it all goes off? Because it's going to go off when we go back to work. Dramas are always a problem. I don't know why, they're always the awkward ones. Um, and I went into a studio once, there were four of us, and the guy said, we've been there about 30 seconds, the guy said, you're the drummer, aren't you? I said, yeah, how do you know that? He said, I can just tell, I've been doing this a long time. So ever since then, ever since you see a, a band walking in, I try and guess who the drummer is. I'm, I'm almost always right, because drummers are always a bit hyperactive. They, their body doesn't sit still, they're, they're moving around all the time, and they're always interested in finding something. Whereas the guitar, the guitar player's just standing a row with someone, and the singer's looking in the mirror, and the bass player's worried it wasn't gonna work. You know, you can just spot them, it's funny. But uh, drummer's always leaving. It's very hard to replace a drummer because somehow when a different drummer comes in and plays differently, it upsets the whole thing. A bit like a goalkeeper in a football team. You need someone reliable in that position. Otherwise, it all goes a bit haywire. But talking about your um, would-be musicians thing, I went to a, I did an interview with some magazine or something. It was in a recording studio. I walked in and it was gleaming, all clean and shiny. It was full of really expensive instruments just sitting on the wall or a really expensive drum kit sitting there, all polished. I thought, this doesn't make sense. I've never seen this before. And then the final straw was I saw a drinks cabinet full of scotch and vodka full decanters. I thought, there's been no musicians in this place. And then <laughs> I said, what the hell is this? He said, well, there's a bunch of yuppies. They're really rich and they all want to be rock stars. So they set this place up so they can come and record, but no one else uses it. Oh, that makes sense now, <laughs> I understand. Anybody else? Because I've got loads. Yeah, I'll, I've, I've got a question, Terry. Um, I think if my memory serves me, the Clash were, were managed by um, Bernie Rhodes. Most of the time, uh, yeah. Who, who, who I think was quite a personality. In, in That's a polite way of putting it, yeah. Yeah, is, is there any sort of management um, lessons, good or bad or whatever, that you could take from someone like Bernie Rhodes? 
Well, Bernie got one thing right. He knew that you had to get everything right and come out and hit the ground running. So he said, you've got to work on every single level. You've got to work on the way you look, the sound, the, the, um, the things you say, your attitude about everything. It just has to be right. And we grilled us and we were in a sort of hot house for months and months. I thought it was years, but when I checked the day, it's just a few months. We feel like we're forever, every day, seven days a week, rehearsing, challenging each other. So we got that right, but it was a pain in the ass, really. Because he had to be kind of the cleverest person in the room and always and always attack people to make himself look bigger, you know. So he's a bit of a pain. But but uh, he got that right. So but I would say if you're involved in any kind of music, if anyone says you've got to sign a contract, we don't want it looked at by a lawyer, then they're, you're obviously walk away without even looking at it. Because there's a lot of that goes on. A quote Terry, what was Billy, what, Terry, what was Billy Idol like? Well, I used to love Billy Idol. He's a really nice guy and he was full of fun. He was a fun person to be around. If you had a migraine, he'd be a nightmare because he didn't stop talking. But he, he was a fun guy and he was always doing funny voices. He was kind of an actor. And when he was 26, we split the band up. He went to America. At that point, he'd never taken any drugs. Went to America at 26 and became a junkie, which is just because although he's off the drugs now and all that, you're never the same after you've been through all that. You're just damaged, you know, and um, kind of odd that he would do that at that stage, really. Oh, good to know. Hmm. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, uh, have you cracked any famous backs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have. I'm not allowed to tell you who I've treated because oh, that's our ethical code. Yeah, I've met lots of lot, lots of famous people. I, I've treated lots of famous people, world champions in various things, athletes and showbiz people, but. They're, generally, they're a bit of a pain in the bum because they tend to think they're more important than everyone else, so they should get the time they want, and just they're just awkward to deal with. Yeah, I much rather deal with Mrs. Smith around the corner, who's grateful you fixed her shoulder, rather than somebody who thinks they're the biggest thing on the planet, and, and so on. So, um, met lots of people. Obviously, met lots of musicians because you do. You know, met Mick Jagger and Bob Dylan and David Bowie and uh, I don't know, um, all sorts, and actors. You know, um, Eddie Murphy and. Um, Jack, um, Jack uh, Nicholson. Nicholson, that's it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you meet all these famous people. They're the same, I know, really. But they. Yeah. I met. I think I was in. A, I was in a studio once in Air Studios, the old Beatles place. And when you're the drummer, you get your bit done first, and you get to hang around for a while. So I was in there, went to play Paul, and uh, there was some building work going on. There, one of the builders came in, an Irish fella, said, "Do you want to play with Paul?" He said, "Oh, sure." So I played Paul with this guy, and I was playing him for hours. I said, so shouldn't you be getting back to work? And um, he said, no, it's all I can do without me. I said, okay, so play some more, Paul. And then, um, oh, this is embarrassing because when it finally came to it, he's a very famous guitar player, but I can't remember his name now. <laughs> <laughs> the most famous guitar player came out of Ireland. Uh, what's his bloody name? He had a band called Taste. Uh, anyway, I assume because he was Irish, he was wearing denim, he was a builder, but of course he was, he was quite a stocky guy, but... Uh, Musician. So you see, you mustn't make assumptions about people. Terry, it, it will come back to you. Well, what advice yeah. would you give for people like us? Right, because um, we're, we're selling every day. It's a, it's a form of performance. Um, how do you keep performance fresh? Right, if you're if you're on the on the tour on the tour on the road and having to perform every night, what did you do to keep things fresh? With the Clash, we changed the set every single night. Every day during the day, we'd say, right, we're gonna, we'd argue about, put that one in there, that one in there, and change the set, which did make it fresh. Um, or you have someone that you don't know what they're going to do until you get on the stage, which is always keeps things fresh. Uh, or you have guests come on, that's another one. Um, challenge yourself, you know, do something different, do different things. Some people are afraid to change because they think you make a mistake. But actually, we've made tons of mistakes and the audience never notices. We play some rubbish gigs. Well, everyone was wrong with the wrong things. And the fans come back and say, oh, it's the best gig I've ever seen. You think, how the, what, are you deaf or something? But that's the way it is. So don't be scared to try things out. And if they fail, it doesn't matter. Although the thing is, these, these days, if you perform anything, someone's going to get it on a, an iPhone, record it and put it on YouTube. So that's unfortunate, I think, because that stifles people taking chances because they, they don't want to take a chance and fail. I don't mind looking <laughs> a fall in front of a room full of people, but I don't want the whole world to see it. So it makes you less inclined to take a chance. And the Rory future Gallagher. music. Right, Roy Sorry. Gallagher. Sorry, Rory, Rory Gallagher. Gallagher. Oh, Rory Gallagher, that's him, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the future very, very music. Nice the future music's changing massively, isn't it? We were just talking before, it's about performance. But you've, you've got your, your kids, would you want them to get into the, into the biz? 
Oh, and if they did, oh, <laughs> I wouldn't want that. Be, so. I, yeah. Why not? Because if they're a drummer, I, you know, as I said before, the drummers always die first. I've got a chapter in my book called "Dead Drummers Don't Lie" because the drummer's always the first one to die in every band, almost. That's that's a bad read, bad thing. Um, so I've gone from the most dangerous profession to the safest profession in one jump, um, and it's just get messed around a lot, and there's no. And if you have kids and that, if you've got a regular income, great. We haven't, it, it, you know, a lot of, um, if you look at the divorce rate and the number of people who commit suicide or, I don't know, who have a mad death, there's just too many of them. So you wouldn't mind that for your kids. You're sounding very spinal tap. <laughs> I, you know what? I tell you not. When I saw that film, Spinal Tap, I thought, God, they've been following me around. I've had all these things happen to me. Drummers exploding, dying everywhere. And then, you know, they had the Stonehenge replica. Yeah. Black Sabbath had a Stonehenge, but a real replica of Stonehenge. It was so big, I couldn't fit it into the stadiums. If it, I played Madison Square Garden, it just fitted in there. Everywhere else, it wouldn't fit. Then they had some explosions when it came on stage. So it came on stage, Madison Square Garden. And the first thing it did was bang like that. And it blew all the electrics. So they go off stage again, quietly, walked off. And that half an hour for the electrician to come and fix it all and go back on again. So there's nothing in that, in that movie. The wife trying to take over the management. I've, I've seen all of that. There is nothing. I didn't laugh in Spinal Tap because I've had all those things and they're not very pleasant. <laughs> Did your amp start to 11? Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> I've got the best amp in the world, the best guitar in the world, best this. I've got the magic drumsticks. I get all that nonsense you hear. Yeah. Anyone else? Dan and I have just monopolised this. Sorry. I've got one actually. I was watching a yeah. program the other day on Eel Pie Island. Um, yeah. On TV. Did you ever play there and what was that like? I recorded there, yeah. Uh, who the hell with? I can't remember. I think it was with Billy Idol. Yeah, because a lot of rock bands used to go, didn't they? And they were the yeah, past. we recorded some demos there before doing our deal with Christmas. And then, and then we went to America a year later and we walked down the high street of a market and there's, there's a Eel Pie demos from Generation X on sale there. I thought, oh, bloody, that's nice, isn't it? We've I've stole a copy and they're all selling it on the streets. But that's, that's the modern world. <laughs> Terry, it is an island, it's weird. Ter Terry, all of us lot are, are stuck in seats all day long. We're, we're working our, our butts off in chairs. Um, while we've got you here, are there any back tips for people who are literally, yeah. permanently stressed to death on a phone and, and we get chronic, and especially for Dean, who didn't half moan about his back? Well, okay, number one, you, you have to exercise. You cannot go through your life without exercising. If you don't exercise, you're going to be in trouble at some point. It's a guarantee. In fact, they say sitting is the new smoking. Uh, so you've got to exercise regularly. But while you're actually at the desk, get up every half an hour and move around. Otherwise, you will get stuck. And number three, vary the chair. Have a normal office chair. Have one of those big balls or gym balls. Sit on that for a while because the muscles have to work. Stop it falling off. And also a kneeling chair. Do you know what I mean by a kneeling chair? You kneel on them. Look up kneeling yeah. chair, Google it. You'll see it. But don't sit all day on any of one of those three. Just keep swapping over, and that will help you back an awful lot. And if, if and you do start a good-looking to... chiropractor, do you know any? No. <laughs> um, that was brilliant. Have we got any more questions? Because I've got a couple for the comms guys, actually. Oh, uh, mate, I'd, I'd bore everyone to death. I think if I carry on. God, you can have the last one, brother. One more. One, I live down the road from Woodford, fancy a jam. <laughs> yeah, when I get my right, studio yeah. finished. <laughs> Brilliant. Right, I've got uh, just a couple. Uh, Terry, thank you very much. Uh, uh, don't, let me monopolise this, but um, this has been hosted by the comms guys. So thank you guys very much. Really appreciate the support. It was a genius idea. It was a genius choice. It's something really, really different. And uh, I've, I've got goosebumps. I'm a little bit buzzing about that. I, that was really good. Um, yeah. So, so to, to Howard and Luke, um, so has comms been resilient for people who started working, obviously this, everyone working from home, what is and isn't working and what has and hasn't been falling down? What's going to change post COVID in terms of people's requirements for their, their comms set up? Um, and is it true that you've actually done everyone a favor in the gang and you've actually managed to help them reduce seats if they needed to? Because I, I, so I don't think that's been the case everywhere else. So there's four questions there. Go. Yeah. Um, it's, been, it's been an interesting challenge because as soon as lockdown was announced, every man and his beast decided they obviously they've got to work from home. So with 
we've got something like two or 3,000 seats out there. Everyone at the same moment wanted to be moved to their home. Obviously with, with, with our VoIP services, you can just literally pick up the phones, plug them in at home, but we've got no control over their broadband. So suddenly there's a whole load of new issues for our team. So it was a really hectic time and it's going to be in reverse when everyone comes back in again, um, getting people set up again. Um, but it was, it, it was really big. It's quietened down now. It's not so bad, but the support team were working their nuts off at, you know, during that period. But were there any providers that have failed? Um, there's quite a few that went that, that just couldn't deal with it. You know, some of the some of the bigger boys, but luckily because we're a, a smaller outfit, we we're sort of leaner and know it in more depth than, than other people. So we knew we know what to look for basically. Yeah, we're lucky. Think... I mean, I was going to say in this day and age, we're lucky we're sort of. Uh, this was ten years ago. Uh, we we now sell all our products are basically voice over IP. Um, 95% of our users use voice over IP, so they can take them home. But if this was 10 years ago, it would have been a whole different story. Now you can just take them home and plug them in. But back then it would have been mobile diverts, it would have been very expensive. Engineers would have had to go in to put the diverts on and things like that. So now we've had a lot of remote workers at home and, and they're all set up working fine. Um, our, our VoIP system allows people to create an office uh, within their own home environment so they can all transfer calls to each other as if they're next to each other which is useful um so you can carry on running as you were and, and any advice to everyone at the moment because this i think there's going to be a mixture of working at in the office and at home a bit more flexible working when they're, when they're looking at putting their system together what should they be looking for or anything that they should definitely be avoiding i think, think uh, as we move as some people move back to their offices. Some people are going to take the decision not to go back. Um, you know, we ourselves have been working from our own homes as if we're one team and, it, and it's worked. You know, at first you're thinking, how is this going to work? Is everyone going to be sitting in their garden not doing any work? But actually you realize that it works and, people, and we can support our team. So I think a lot more businesses are going to look at the remote working possibility of their teams and cut back on, on the expensive office costs in London. Um, num you know, there's quite quite a few will be looking at that route as we move forward. So, so there's no preference over Gamma or Horizon or anything at the moment. No, in terms of um, systems that we're using, there's one. We've got a few different systems that we can put in place. One of them is very good for remote working, and it can even incorporate mobiles and uh, the, the apps as well, which has been really useful for a lot of companies. So they've got some people in the office, some on the app some on their mobile phones and they're all linking together and using the same system. Brilliant. Right. That's the brilliant plug for you. You happy with that? Yeah. If anyone wants an to yeah. <laughs> or look at it and build it for you. Right. Or the spoke, uh, so uh, build it. Is, is, is Gary on this call, by the way? Yeah, he's there. He's muted. Okay. Well done, Gary. Brilliant idea of yours. Um, smash in. Howard, go on. You can have the last line. Well, if, we're, if you're happy, have the last word. I'm just so pleased that we got Mr. Chimes onto the call because he, he's such a big star. And we love this piece of music. <laughs> well done, Terry. Thank you, Daddy. Really appreciate it. Well done, Tom's guys. Thank you, everyone. Uh, stay safe, Thanks everyone. See much. you on the other side. Thank you, Scott. Stay safe, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Should I stay or should I go? <laughs> Thanks, Terry. That was okay, didn't it? Yeah, you didn't get to plug your book. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Back to work for a while, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think everyone's yeah. Yeah, off, off Zooming back to off. the office. Yeah. <laughs> I'll send yeah. a link around to the book. Thanks, Terry. Oh, okay, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, I'd love it, yeah. Okay. I'll do that. Yeah. Thank and you I'll, very much. Yeah. I'll see you next week. If you put my website name, uh, terrychimes.com, that's the way to get it. Cool. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. We'll send yeah, that if you, Emma, if you put a message out that the you know that the book to plug that book, it's a great yeah, book. I'll, I'll do I'll that. Look through it, yeah. Mm. Thank you All right. Thank you, everyone. Right. Thanks, Emma. Good day. Good job. Yeah, thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Cheers, Siri. See you later. Bye.